fights to the last drop. Are you gonna blow your head off? Take good aim and don't forget to duck. A light sucks every Monday and all the way to Sunday. But I wouldn't have it any other way. I don't care how you're doing. What's up or how's it hanging? I'd like to buy this world one last drink. Life sucks all of the time Stick it up your sunshine And then you'll see the clouds every day And then you'll see the clouds every day And then you'll see the clouds every day Welcome to the crazy life, everybody. Uh, this is a late night episode, <laughs> as they all have been trending towards in the last few weeks. Um, it is the wee hours of the morning at 10.43 <laughs> p.m. So I guess not technically morning for most, but uh, yeah, definitely sleepy time for me. Um, but So excuse my yawns. Um, that being said, welcome. Uh, my name's Jen, and I'm your hostess tonight. For all of the new listeners, I'm glad to have you. For all of our regulars, it's fabulous to have you back listening in the house again. Um, that being said, of course, as always, I have Brian with me. Hey, Brian. Hi. So, how has your week been? Um... Well, I'm trying to think. When we last recorded, had I gone to my the psychologist yet? No, you okay. were preparing for the meeting with her. Okay, that's what I thought. Her. Okay, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I keep getting confused because we record different days, so I, <laughs> I can never remember when things fall. You know, it was Thursday, I believe. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, and my mm-hmm. my appointment was like the two days or or day Wednesday. After. Yeah. yeah, I think something like that. Yeah. Anyway. um... So, you know, I'm not going to, obviously, I'm not going to talk about everything I talked about because, you know, there should be some privacy in there. But um, it, it was good. It was nice. To, you know, I just sat down and she asked me questions. You know, you have to fill out a packet of, you know, do you feel this way? How often do you this, or this, you mm-hmm. know? And uh, it was interesting because one of the packet uh, pieces of the packet was a um, P- PTSD checklist. Ooh. And it was like, you know, list anything, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't really have anything to go on this. I haven't really suffered any major traumas in my life as far as, mm. well, so. Not a comparison, yeah. When I get back into the, the room with her, you know, we're talking. And I was like, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't fill that out. I was like, because I didn't really feel like I had anything to fit. And I was like, I can give you a couple things that have happened, mm-hmm. but I can't, I don't know that I would put them in there. I was like, well, you know, and I was like, you know what, I'll just tell you and you can, you know, do what you wish with the, the info. Yes. So, you know, I told her about, um, I don't think I've ever talked about this on here before, um, about one day I was woke up, I'm laughing, but it's more nervous laughter. I was woken up by my mom and, um, my dad had been bleeding. Like at one point it was a nosebleed. Like this has happened on two separate occasions. One was a nosebleed. And I mean, it was an epic nosebleed. And, uh, you know, for those who don't necessarily like blood, I'm going to get maybe a tad graphic here. So maybe you want to forward a bit. Um, anyway, you know, in our bathroom, there was blood all over the sink and everything from because his nose just basically just started gushing blood and they couldn't get it to stop. And, uh, you know, so he had to go to the emergency room. And he went into the emergency room and, you know, they packed his nose with like 20 feet of gauze. And I say uh, 20 him- feet. Huh? I was gonna say you're missing a point. No, no, this we... is there was. Oh, the, this is the first. one? I don't know if you were part of the picture at this point. This happened a long, long time ago. You're, the oh, one okay, you're thinking is... of is the secondary thing. The, okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Um, anyway, they packed his his nose with like this insane amount of gauze. Like when I, I say twenty feet, but I'm not exaggerating a lot. Like there was it was feet of gauze, because you know your um your sinus cavity can hold a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So they pack it and pack it until basically it, it stopped because they had, you know, obviously you can't keep losing blood. That's no good. 
So, you know, but whatever. I got up. I had to clean it up. You know, my mom woke me up to tell me they were she was taking him to the ER. And, you know, okay, fine. You know, I dealt with it. I cleaned it up, whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, then years later, um, he had had um, uh, chemotherapy and stuff. And at one point he had, um, they had to scrape something in his jaw. And when they did, his gums didn't heal back up. Like they had to cut in and whatever. And they didn't heal up. And um, he had a blood clot in his mouth that broke off. And again, for those who are queasy to blood, you may want to move forward. <laughs> uh, basically, it was looked look like something fresh out of like CSI or Dexter or something. It was a crime scene. In the bathroom. And again, I'm not exaggerating much. It, it's it, there was blood all over the sink, the wall, the floor, the toilet, the mirror. I mean, it, yeah. it looked like someone opened a vein in there. It, it, it was graphic and. This time, I believe you, when my mom went this time, didn't I think? Um, yeah, that was when I was staying with you okay. guys, and um, your mom called for us, and we we came out, and yeah. uh, and so I took them to the hospital. Yeah, and you. Um, I, I don't think you were with us. No, but no, I cleaned it up. Well, I came home and I helped as well, mm. but you had gotten a good portion of it going. Yeah, it was, um, but when we got to the hospital, the most disturbing part was uh we got to the hospital and he was bleeding emergency room they take they came around the nurse came around and took his blood pressure and the look on her face like blood just drained from her face and she took his blood pressure again and called another nurse over to take a look and verify and the nurse goes we need to move now and they took him in the wheelchair and ran down the hall yeah because he had lost so much blood Yeah, he had lost so much blood they came back later to tell us that he had lost so much blood by the time he had gotten to the hospital that they were surprised he was even conscious and that's why they wanted to double check his blood pressure because they could not believe it was so low and he was still able to talk to them yeah so they rushed him back and i believe that was the time he got a blood transfusion yes um Mm -hmm. and uh I believe did, didn't that? I feel like it happened one more time too that he no. bled. No, okay. So Mm-mm. it's just thinking of the nose and the other then. Okay, because the first time was his nose. It was yeah. Oh boy, I remember the, them taking the gauze out. Yeah, the second time was worse. Um, yes, much, 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 much worse. It was and, you know. And yeah. but I, I just I got up and I started. You know, at first there's that shock of mm-hmm. there's blood everywhere and it's my dad's blood. You know, like so I was a little freaked out. Sure. But then I immediately, it became like, uh, you know, crisis mode, you know, a mm-hmm. crisis management mode. And it was just, okay. And started, you know, try to get everything cleaned up first. And then you worry about, you know, disinfecting stuff after, but trying to get it all off the the wall and all, all the different stuff, you know, and I told her that <laughs> I'm telling her this stuff. So matter of factly, you know, and she just kind of looked at me and she was like, wow. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I, I, I kind of wonder if she was just like how calm I was. And I was like, right. you know, in my head, the first thing that's going is going, she's probably going, this guy's a sociopath. <laughs> like, <laughs> like he had no emotion. Like his dad just bled all over the place and he's just like, all right, clean it up. You know, and it just, yeah. but, it, and that's kind of how it was, but that's honestly, that's kind of how I deal with this mm-hmm. stuff. You know, the day my dad Me died, too. I told her about how, you know, the day my dad died about my mom and I. Uh, my dad died over a sink, so my mom and I laid his body down on the floor, uh, you know, until the coroner got there, and um, we, uh, you know, which is a really awful experience. <laughs> I just don't know any other way to say that. But yeah, that was the because uh, I was still staying with you guys at the time, yeah. and uh, I was the one that found him. Yeah, and which is worse than what I went through. <laughs> You know, honestly, it's it's hard. Well, to say. for me, it would right. have been worse because yeah. it's just it's it's a different um, perspective. Yeah. yeah. Because well, here I, here's I, why I loved him. I mean, yeah. I, I love Woody, but he was he was your father. I mean, yeah. He was not my father. That's my point that because first. yeah because if I had gone in there, I would have found him, and then I have to deal with the shock of everything and the sadness and all of that emotion. Yeah. Whereas by the time I went in there to help with my mom. I already knew, had my moment of, of breakdown. She already knew. She had her moment, you know, and then we went in there and did that because, yeah. and so we already were 
aware of things that we didn't, you know, so that to me, it would, that was the easier of the two for you. It's not, kinda, maybe not, but for me, that would have been e- or worse. I mean, than what I dealt with. It's, it's tough. It's one of those situations that, cause I kind of knew, you know, I yeah. woke up, it was really early in the morning and I woke up to do some work from home cause it was a Saturday. That's and... what, my mom and I were trying to work that out yesterday. We couldn't figure out if it was a Friday or a Saturday. That's right. You were working from home. Cause yeah. I was like, Jen got up to go to work. And I forgot you were working from home. That's okay. Yeah, because it was right about the time that Hurricane Katrina, I believe it was, or one uh, of the big ten, hurricanes. Ten years through. ago. So. Yeah. yeah, so I'm pretty sure it was Katrina. Mm. And so I was doing some work from home. And um, I when I got up and I walked to the kitchen, he wasn't in his chair. And I, wa- and I walked to the kitchen and the light to the bathroom was on. And I called his name, you know, hoping for a response, obviously. But knowing kind of in my gut that that was not going to get one. Yeah. And when I walked in and saw him hunched over the sink, I knew, but I need to be sure before I told anybody. Mm. So I went over and I, you know, I took his pulse or tried to take his pulse anyways. And, um, you know, when, when I confirmed that, I mean, he was, he was cold. I mean, I'll be blunt. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was cold and into the touch and I kind of knew that there was nothing there anymore yeah. and so at that point that's when i got you up you know and then you got your mother up yeah and then we kind of, and it's interesting how you deal with different things yeah because i'm like you a lot of people and i've shared this story are amazed by how matter of fact yeah. i can share it well and i think how unemotional at the time even it was for me yeah because like you said you just you go in crisis mode well i think part of it though too is that when you look back at stuff i think in moment you know just like and in, in moments of trauma you tend to forget details you know yeah. even if you think i can remember things clearly a great mm-hmm. example i was in a car accident with my nephew neither one of us can remember taking our seat belts off yet neither of us had seat belts on when they helped us out of the car Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so, but I can mm-hmm. give you everything else in minutia through that mm-hmm. whole thing, but I can't tell you about when I took a seatbelt off and neither can he. So either yeah. the seatbelts failed or we took them off and just don't remember that detail, you know. Exactly. Anyway, with this. Yeah, so what did she say? So I told her, you know, about laying him to the floor and she's like, well, do you get flashbacks or any? And I was like, you know, it's weird because the blood, I don't so much anymore because we don't live in that house anymore. Mm-hmm. For a while, I did. Every time I went in there, it was almost like, you know, like on TV, someone walks into a room and they'll do the quick uh, cutaway of, uh, yeah. you know, this or that happened. That's kind of what it was like for a while. And same with my dad dying. You know, I couldn't go into that bathroom for a while. It it just, I couldn't because yeah. that's all I could picture. And I told her, I said, well, oddly enough, I said this time of year is when I have flashbacks of more so and think about more of the the death part because, you know, for those who don't know, we're recording on a a Friday. Yesterday it was 10 years ago my dad died. And so it's still very, very vivid in in my head. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, and she was like, oh, okay. And I was like, yeah, so this time of year is, you know. (laughs) Extra hard. It's probably in the dreams. I don't know if you still have the dreams, but for a long time you had dreams. Yeah, I don't as much now. I still do occasionally. A lot of that, I think, had to do with I felt a lot of guilt about I went to bed early the night that he, he passed mm-hmm. away. And, I, you know, I had a lot of that, well, if I had stayed up like I normally do, I could have saved him. Or I could have – and realistically, he – you know, they think he had a, a heart attack and it wouldn't have mattered. Mm-hmm. You know, what, you know, so – Oh, and just to kind of – and I apologize. Um, we probably should have mentioned this earlier. Um Brian's dad had um, serious bouts of cancer, yeah. and towards the end, um, the last year or so, he was prognosed as being terminal. Yeah. So, I mean, so his death was not... Yeah, it wasn't unexpected. Super shocking. Yeah, yeah we knew... Unexpected. It was still upsetting and disturbing, of course, as every death is, yeah. but it was not unexpected. I mean, at that point, he was on a feeding tube and breathe in oxygen and... You know, yeah. so I mean, he had been very, very advanced for a while. Yeah. So it was more of a matter of time than anything else. Right. Um, but you know, it's still 
sad and, and very yeah, emotional. It yeah. doesn't take anything away from the feelings about it, mm-hmm. but there's some background for you. Yeah, you know, but she didn't get too much into it because, you know, the first visit is more of a um, – it's a fact gathering. You know, they're, sure. tr- they're trying to get out all the information they can about you, and I think then, you know, they form a, a, a plan and um, – you know, uh, she asked me what, what my goals were. Like, why are you here? Basically, what do you want to get out of this? And I was like, honestly, I don't know because I've never done this before. So, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I told her, I was like, you know, obviously I want to be what I feel is a functioning part of society. I don't like the, you know, being a prisoner of anxiety and depression, you know, and, Mm -hmm. um, and such. So, you know, we went through a lot of that and, uh, uh, she's like, well, how often do you want to come back? And I'm like, again, I don't know how this works. So you're the expert here, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. So I go back actually Monday. Um, I don't, I don't know what frequency at this point yet, but I go back Monday to talk uh, to her again. I did tell her I really would prefer to stay away from anti-anxiety or antidepressants if I can, because I didn't. And I explained to her how I felt, you know, mm-hmm. the ups, the downs, and then the withdrawal, you know. Mm-hmm. And she was like, yeah, you're not supposed to. I'm like, I know. <laughs> yeah. Again, for those listening, if you're thinking about going off of an antidepressant, do it with your doctor's help. And if if for some reason, like me, you didn't have the ability to do that, at least try to wean yourself off. Don't just yes. cold turkey. Go Absolutely. slow. Now, with me, I didn't have a choice because I ran out. And mm-hmm. by the time I could have weaned myself, I could have only done it for about two days, which wouldn't have made a difference. You know? Yeah. Um, the withdrawals are horrible from it, though. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the very – was it – was I had going through those at the beginning of our show or not? I can't remember. No. No? Okay. I, that was on Salty Language. I talked about him then. Okay. I don't even know what episode. I mean, you've but, talked about him here, but... Yeah. yeah. A- anyway, they, uh, you know, so going through all that, so I, you know, I go back Monday, but she was totally on board. I told her that I'm not closed off to the idea of them. I just would prefer not to... I'd like to explore other options first, if there's other options, and then if, if the, you know, she feels it's a good idea, then we'll revisit. Mm-hmm. You know, and she was totally on board with that so because she's like look she's like yeah that she's like the goal of those is not to make you feel gray she's Mm -hmm. like the goal of those is to make you feel so you can feel good you know Mm -hmm. she's like if you weren't feeling good then that wasn't doing what it's supposed to do and i was like i told her i was like i think it's because there's other underlying issues that needed addressing that I, I honestly mm-hmm. think where I'm at and the stuff that's in my head, I think therapy is probably the thing I should have done first. Uh, I think medicine sure. should have come along in the process, but I really think therapy is more important for me because mm-hmm. I really think there's a lot of things in my life, in my head that I need to resolve. Sure. And, and I need help with that. So I, I think that's kind of where I'm at. And I think I finally realized that. And I think that's the biggest reason. I think that's why the antidepressant didn't really work for me mm-hmm. because it wasn't just, it wasn't just clinical, like it wasn't just the, the clinical side of depression that was bothering me. There's all their things in my head that, you know, from the death of my dad and stuff that I think I have been left unresolved mm-hmm. and other, and like having to close a, you know, a business that was kind of like my dream. And that kind of stuff, the the failure there, I felt like I failed my dad. You know, like, I think there's a lot of these things I need to sort and get out of my head. And I think Mm -hmm. once I do some of that, I think it'll help open the doors for, you know, actual recovery, you know, from this. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure there's lots of our listeners that Mm -hmm. are almost gobsmacked with the insight that you were able to pull Mm -hmm. because you know i've been on this journey you know along with you for a very very long time and the ability for you to recognize the depths of help that you need in the areas that you need help it's so just it's awe-inspiring because it's so difficult to do yeah i mean so hard to do to look at yourself and to really examine your thoughts and your feelings and your decisions and why you're making the decisions you're doing and you're making and stuff. Mm -hmm. And to really take a hard look at what, what do I need to be healthy and then take action upon it. It's huge and make sure that you celebrate that and, you know, and know that 
many people can't do that. Yeah, I know. It, it's it's why I and I I told her when I was there. I was mm-hmm. like, you know, I was like, one of the hardest things for me is that I know when I go and I sit and I talk to somebody about this stuff. I told her I was like, I I know what I'm trying to say and. I think I've got it sorted well enough that I can say it pretty well and explain it to people. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and I think a lot of people take that as though I'm in a good place. And in ways, I am compared to others. Right. You can at least put it into words, but it doesn't mean you're dealing with it. Yeah. But it's also, I'm also in a really bad place. Not to mention, part of the reason that I'm where I'm at is I've been dealing with this since I'm 12. And I'm very analytical. Like, constantly I'm looking and reading. And you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's like... I don't recommend going 25 years untreated just so you have clarity. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, I would Mm -hmm. like, if you feel you need help, go get the help. If it's been six months, a week, I don't care what it is. Go get the help. Don't wait 25 years. And you know, before you're really well, less than that. Cause I, I did go for, you know, medicine and stuff, but you know, a few years ago, but it's still way too long, way, way, way too long. Sure. Absolutely. But, the point isn't necessarily the time it took you to get no, there. No, but I think that's what has partially led to the bouts of clarity I have through the fog here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but still, it's like the, the amount of time you dealt with it. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, obviously it does play a part, like you said. Yeah. But regardless of even all of that, it's just, it's just, it's amazing. And, It's something that's very unique and very special and it's something that not everybody can do. And the, you know, the fact that you've done this and you've come this far is amazing. Well, that's why I I told her, I was like, I pretty much feel like I'm at the point that it's either exhaust all the arrows in my quiver or give up. Like that's where I'm at. It's either... I need to throw everything I can at this to stop this, or I have to basically just openly admit that whether it's today, 10 years from now, I've given up. Like it's, Mm -hmm. those are the options because that's really where I am. It's I've, I've drifted this path for so long, just existing. I haven't been living for, for a long time, you know, right? I haven't been happy. Cause she asked me, she's like, when's the last time you can had, prolonged happiness and i was like i can't tell you Mm -hmm. that's a sad statement and i ask everybody out there who's listening you don't have to answer me but ask Mm -hmm. yourself especially if you're a person who thinks you may be suffering when's the last time you were happy like legitimate it doesn't have to be like grand scale happy but when were you like for a few Mm -hmm. for a few days you know Mm -hmm. i can't tell you i can tell you when i was happy for a five minute stretch i can tell Mm -hmm. you you know the happiest Happy moments. Yeah. yeah. The happiest moment I can remember, you know, was, you know, we were at the ocean. I was standing out looking at the ocean, just mm-hmm. nothing. It was the first time in years that there was just nothing going on in my head. I was totally just clear of thought and everything was just calm. And, and then my stepdad wanted to take a picture. And then your stepdad wanted to take a picture. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so immediately it was, uh, and in fact, I think I did that. I think I actually sighed because I was like, damn it. <laughs> like, come on, university, you can't give me five minutes or ten minutes of this. I get five. I get it. I'm lucky enough to get the five. But, you know, that that kind of a thing. And, right. you know, so it, it's sad. I, I look back at that and it's like, God, better than half my life. I can't tell you prolonged happiness i can tell moments here or there but i can't give you like you know life was pretty good from this point to this point i just can't and a lot of it was you know stress that was on me or stress i most of it's stress i put on myself but there were elements of stress that was put on me Mm -hmm. and then i also assumed stress on top of that you know Mm -hmm. and and it's so you know like i said i i can't i can't preach enough If you need the help, go get the help. And I'm not preaching the therapy off of one visit. I'm just saying that, you know. Whatever you're, you know, pick your, I don't want to say pick your poison because that's not it. Uh, Pick your orange juice. Pick pick what's going to make you feel better. And really, and don't be afraid to throw anything at it. Because in fairness, like me with depression, I'm just using my example, is depression's not afraid to throw anything at me. It, it will turn anything that I've that could be positive into a negative. 
Yes. So you can't be afraid to throw anything at it. Whatever. It doesn't matter how silly the example. Like, I'm a person who for years and years was like, you know, meditation's bunk. Like, what's the point of all this kind of thing? And I get it. It's the trying to find that center, that balance, that calmness, and that kind of a thing. And then when I think thought about it more, I'm like, I never have that calmness. Even mm-hmm. when I've tried, I can't shut everything down, you know, as much as I'd love to. You know, it's like, you know, and it, all, well, what always goes through my head, there's a mo- movie called uh, For the Love of the Game with Kevin Costner. <laughs> he's a pitcher. And he's standing on the mound, and the first step before when he's going through his motions is clear the mechanism. And you just hear all the outside noise of all the fans cheering and all this other stuff, and he's like, whoa, and then silent, you know. And that's what pro athletes have to do. They have to block all that stuff out, you know. And and that's I always in my head that's what goes, or it's like be the hole from uh, Caddyshack. You know, it's the same idea, though, is you're clearing, you're doing something to clear your head. And it's – it's hard. I can't quite do that. And that's where, that's where medicine may help because medicine can help calm that stuff down and, you know, and maybe combining that with some meditation and, you know, there may be, again, I may have to throw five things at it to get that result. But, you know, at this point I'm trying to try what I can because if I don't, I, I just, man, I don't even know how to say this. The hardest, the all I see is hopelessness otherwise. And that's awful. And you're, yeah. and <laughs> you you're choosing. Yeah. You're making the choice to to fight. Yes. And that's, again, it's huge. It's what we, we yeah. tell you, each and every one of you guys every single day. Choose to fight. Yeah. Choose to fight for yourself. Fight for your health. Fight, fight for what makes you happy. And regardless of whatever it is, you deserve yeah. to be happy. Right. You know, everyone deserves to have happiness. And if you are not happy, yeah. you need to do something to fix that now, and start making those choices. Now, I will say this, and this is something that I, I will point out, is um, you have to be – you also have to be careful about um, your level of happy. Like what makes you, Mm. you know, you can't set the bar too high. There's nothing Mm -hmm. wrong with setting a high bar, but you also have to be careful as we've talked on the show about celebrating your wins, no matter how small they are, you Mm -hmm. have to, you have to, and this is, and I openly have admitted this for me, it's one of my hardest things to do is to accept the moment you're in and just be okay in the moment, be content in the moment that you're in. And it's like, you know, maybe you're only going to get that five minutes staring out at the water. Maybe that's all you're going to get. So you have to accept that and go, you know, that I was happy then. You know, even if, you mm-hmm. know, like for me, it feels like there's a drought between moments. But a person who was, and again, we don't, I hate the word, but I keep using it because it mm-hmm. works. Uh, air quote, normal. Mm-hmm person could look at my life and go well what about this and this and mm-hmm. this and go yeah but in my head it'll, I'll, it'll always be yeah but yeah mm-hmm. but yeah but, you know right like i loved having the comic shop that me and tony had i absolutely loved it but the stress from it crippled me <laughs> oh yes i yes, mean in a lot of ways i'm not blaming it for my overall stuff but it's certainly it's another you know right it's, it's, a, a, it's another notch on the bed. Post. Yeah, and it, it was, you know, worrying about that. And that, that's for anybody who owns their own business. You're going to run through that. There's just that yeah. constant worry of where's money going to come from? How can I this? How can I that? You know, and it's mm-hmm. it's all on the owners. Like, the, it's not, you know, it's not on, like, you know, uh, Walmart or something. They've got people all over the place worrying about little facets here and there and then other people who just oversee things. And it's like when you own your own business, you're every level of that. <laughs> you know, right. you have to sweat the small stuff and the big stuff. And, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, like I said, I loved doing that. It was great. But at the mm-hmm. same time, there was a lot of it that was really not good for me stress-wise and it was really awful. But, again, that's typical you know, business, typical yeah. business, yeah. but it's just with other stuff added to it. It, you know, it, it just adds to it over the years. And that, that's where a lot of that stuff comes from. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Anyway, I hijacked this whole thing. You just asked me how my week was and this turned into no, us almost going right into awesome. topic. Are you kidding? So this is, like I said, I'm, I mean, I'm sure our listeners <laughs> and, and please let us know people. We'd love to hear from you, yeah. but I'm sure our listeners is getting, or 
is getting yeah. are getting yeah a, a lot from this because it it is it's incredibly inspiring and in motivating mm. you know hearing your journey and hearing you as you go through this stuff it just it, it's amazing i mean from someone who has their own journey and stuff it's just i, I love hearing other people's successes because yeah. it makes me believe even more in my own successes yeah you know it just it makes me believe it, it's almost like um, seeing someone living their dreams that yeah. you're like, I know maybe I will never live that dream. Yeah. But well, <laughs> I can like vicariously live. Yeah. That. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like, I was telling, I forgot Not who it was. That you, you know, going on this journey is a dream. Yeah. Like, no, no. I, I, I told somebody online the other day, cause it's someone who has met someone else via like Twitter or something. Yeah. And they're doing an online, uh, a long distance relationship and they've flown to meet each other and different stuff. And, and uh, I was like, you know, I was like, I'm insanely jealous of you because mm -hmm. you found that. And I love the fact that the Internet has allowed you to find that other person. And distance, right. distance hasn't fully stopped you. It's me. You know, it, it, there's a speed bump because of the travel, but it mm -hmm. hasn't stopped it. And I was like, you know, I'm jealous as hell. I'm like, but I'm incredibly happy because, you know, I know how hard it is for people to find other people. And it's, you know, mm -hmm. the world can be really isolating on its own. You know, Absolutely. just the way life is sometimes. And I just love the fact that people can still find each other. It's great. I'm I'm more than happy for them, but I'm also insanely jealous of them because, you know, I wish I could, you know, we could all run through that too. I, I hate anyone having to feel alone or be alone or not have somebody, you know, because it, it sucks. There's elements of it that you miss and you don't get and nothing can fill in. You know, mm -hmm. like you can have 12 cats and it's still not the same as a person sleeping next to you, you know? It's, right. <laughs> True. Yeah. You know, so, True. but yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, I'm yeah. excited. I'm ex again, I'm excited for Monday, but I'm also really nervous because I'm Monday really is the first day of treatment. You know what I mean? Yes. The first day sure. was just essentially an evaluation. And then this day is the first, and I, I don't know what to expect because I don't know, you know, cause each, um, each therapist is different, you know, they, you know, their approach mm -hmm. can be different. So I don't know what I'll walk into and, you know, well, I've honestly, I've heard, um, I've heard a lot of analogies between a uh, therapist and dating mm -hmm. because it is, it's, it's very similar to, to dating someone where the first date is more about learning about each other. Right. The evaluation. Second, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. first date's going to be evaluation. The second day is when you start really getting to know somebody. Yeah. And then you see if you can build a communication relationship out of it, mm -hmm. you know, and just like with dating, some people are good matches and some people aren't. Right. You know, and and that's still a therapist and a, and a patient. Right. And you don't know until you're a exactly. Bit into it. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what I was just going to say. And that's something, you know, I do want to point out is um, much like a, any doctor really mm -hmm. is if you don't like the results you're getting find a different doctor there's you know now i know obviously people get handcuffed with you know what what your insurance will cover and won't cover or mm -hmm. difference or if you're through the state sometimes you don't have an option like there's like you have to go here to this doctor and that's your own you know but mm -hmm. it, if you are afforded the option and you're not happy with what you're getting then switch you know um because a lot of people can and communicate it yeah. i mean let your doctors know because if their way of communicating is not working for you yeah. and you're kind of stuck and you got to go to the same doctor, yeah. be honest with them. Yeah, so, you it's, know, it, I, I need a little more time. It's like, I, I need you to spend a little more time with me or I need you to listen a little bit more yeah. or, you know, let them know those things because by letting them know, you're giving them the opportunity to correct yes. things. Because yeah. if they don't know, they don't they know they can't yeah, anything exactly. to correct. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the therapist, if you don't feel what they're doing is working now, I will. And again, on top of that, mm -hmm. you know, you have to give things a fair chance also. Oh, sure. Because nothing drives me crazier. And I use bowling as an analogy because I, I know it, you know, I've bowled for years yeah. and years is sometimes somebody will give people, you'll give somebody a tip. You'll be like, hey, you're doing this wrong. If you do this, it, it should correct it. They'll do it once. It didn't, it didn't work. And they're like, well, that didn't work. And it's like. You do know it takes like 10,000 times to kind of master something, right? Like you, you need to throw 
Like, you can't just, oh, I threw a ball this way. And it's like, no, you need to do it over and over and over. You mm-hmm. know, it's why. And you gr- didn't quite get it right. Shortstops take grounder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Shortstops in baseball take grounder after grounder after grounder so that they can get used to getting the ball out of their glove, getting the throw off on time, pl- right. throwing the ball right so that you're setting your second baseman up for a good double play ball. or You know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. you have to. Repetition equals. Uh, success. That's the way that sports look at it. So, sure. and it and it makes sense. Many things in life, you know, you can't be a drummer by just sitting down and hit. You know, the somebody just showing you, you know, random song, and you're just like, all right. Unless you're a prodigy of some sort, you know, you're right. you're not gonna ace it that first time. You're probably gonna suck. So you yeah. have to at least give it a fair go. You know, right. Like someone's like, you know, they recommend meditation. You sit down one time and maybe it doesn't work and you're like, oh, it's garbage. I'm not, you know, <laughs> it's like, exactly. maybe give it a week, you know, <laughs> exactly. try it a few times a day for a week and see, you know, so see there is that works. element. Yeah. yeah. Don't be closed minded to it. You know, again, we talked about that a little bit, I think on the last episode where I was talking about Heno and uh, Angela uh, mm. about how they approached, you know, uh, Heno approached therapy where he was like, I'm not going to talk about alcohol at all, you know, and it's like, mm. Mm, it doesn't seem to be, you know, like you can't, I don't think you can go into therapy. You've got, maybe you have goals, but you don't, you don't dictate how it's going to go. Cause that if you, if you're going to dictate how it's going to go, why bother? Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't make a lot or of sense. Or if you draw your own conclusions from the beginning. Yeah. Like, oh, they're just going to say this. Yeah. Mm, that's not quite how it works. You need to be open to hear what they're right, truly going to say right. and not lead them in different directions. You yeah. need to let it organically happen. Right. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, there's been stuff, you know, like people start coughing and sneezing and someone will be like, why don't you go to the doctor? And like, they're just going to give me a cough medicine. Right. You're you're probably right unless it gets into, you know, unless it's an right. pneumonia or something or, a, you know, mm-hmm. some infection. But, yeah, you know, uh, don't. Don't uh, don't allow yourself to uh, psych yourself out of mm-hmm. of going just because you think you know the answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, I guess exactly. Is, yeah. So. so that being said, <clears throat> um, I wanted to talk about something that was kind of struck me this week, and not just because of your dad, the anniversary of your dad's death, which we spoke about earlier. How odd those words are together. Yeah. <laughs> just sounds weird feels yeah. weird but um a friend of mine a good friend of mine lost her grandmother um coincidentally yesterday and she's very very close with her and when i was talking with her about it something that brought to mind is something that has really kind of sustained me through a lot of different sad changes in my life that i've gone through and which is Don't let others or society dictate how you feel. Because it's so easy for us to fall into the habit of, I need to be sad because that's what is expected. I need to cry because that is what is expected of me. I need to do this because that is what's expected of me. And inside, we may not be mirroring those emotions. Mm -hmm. And if we're not mirroring those emotions... That also brings on a lot of guilt. Well, and real quick, sometimes the way you process those emotions is not the way I'll process those emotions. So we could both be feeling the same thing, but maybe I don't cry much. Yeah. Somebody else does. You know, that doesn't make either one right or wrong. Yeah. Oh, exactly. I mean, and that's, I think that's the whole, the whole point of it mm-hmm. is that we have to take control and ownership of our own emotions and what they what they truly are. Now, when dealing with with sadness, I guess for lack of a better word, I'm going to call it justifiable sadness, but that's not really quite the right terms for it. I'm not really talking about sadness from like clinical depression or the dark sadness that comes from mental illness or things like that. Yeah. I'm talking about more of... Um, cause and effect sadness maybe that's more yeah. appropriate you know something that that happens in life um you lose a job you lose a loved one um ending of a relationship mm-hmm. you know all of these things that are intrinsically sad sad moments yeah and they're very important cuz so often 
Um, I think I'm going to harken back to your your dad and what your dad said um, when he when we were talking about his funeral and what he wanted and stuff. And he said that he doesn't want that sad music. He wanted uh, 50s and 60s car music. Yeah. Like at 50s his and funeral. 60s rock and roll kind of. Yep. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, the old school rock and roll and that type of, you know, fun stuff, you know, like wake up little Susie and very non-traditional music for a funeral, of course, mm-hmm. in for, you know, awake and viewings and all that stuff. But the reason he wanted that is because he said, you know, people are going to feel sad enough on their own. They don't need music to encourage more sadness. Yeah, it reminds you like a movie, you know, when there's a sad part in a movie and they start playing the music that's supposed to help you in the emotional journey, you know, just in case you weren't feeling it from the imagery alone, the music will help pull you through. And it's like, mm-hmm. you really don't need that at a funeral. If you're not feeling sad, kind of, a lot of times it's almost like, why are you there? Because you're generally going to feel sad if you're at a funeral. Or, right. I mean, unless the person was a jerk and then maybe you're tap dancing or something i don't know but yeah you never know most you know, most people somebody else yeah but. most people are are sad or at least um feigning sadness you know yes. whichever it is you know you know and that's in you don't need that music and you no. you know some people do i'm not gonna say it's neg it's bad but for the most part all that music really tends to do is just heighten your sadness yes. and make it even greater and instead of doing that and using outside sources to dictate how sad we're going to be or even how happy i mean it doesn't necessarily have to be sadness but we're going to focus on sadness for this conversation um don't let that dictate how you feel and it's okay to feel what you're feeling there's no need for guilt you know just because somebody next to you is sobbing their eyes out doesn't make their pain any more real or less than yours yeah it's not a competition you know and there's definitely nothing to feel guilty about that maybe you're not sighing maybe you don't feel yeah. like crying your eyes out at that well moment. i i mean i can give a perfect example of that mm-hmm. was uh you know a few months ago uh, my niece uh overdosed and yes. and we lost her and you know her and i weren't very close but i you know i still i felt bad that it was a tragic, you know, I hate to see, you know, it, it was, she's super young and uh, what was she? 20, 23. 23? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it's like, she's way too young and, you know, she had a son and it, it's sad to see drugs take anybody, no matter the age, you know, kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and, and just, it, it was just sad, you know? And then when I see my sister, you know, it was destroying my sister. Sure. And it tore me up because, you know, whether it's, because I'm a guy or just whatever. I want to protect my sister. I don't want anything to hurt her, you know? Well, nobody wants to see one yeah. of their loved ones in, and, in, in that much pain. Right. Sure. And, and, you know, there, but there's nothing I can really do to stop it. Mm-hmm. She's going to hurt, you know, you know, no matter how many hugs you get or, you know, whatever, you you know, comforting words you get from somebody, it's going to hurt. There's just no other way around it. Mm-hmm. But I didn't cry and I didn't feel like an immense sadness. I just was like just indifferent almost and i felt really bad about that i even i mentioned it to you i was like you know Mm -hmm. i was like i feel really indifferent about this and i feel bad that i feel indifferent now the indifference can be because of my mental illness you know that can be part of depression i'm sure that's a factor in there but there is no place for guilt right in there yeah and I think that it's very difficult for a lot of us to accept. Yeah. But it is okay. When it comes to feelings, mm-hmm. whatever you're feeling is correct. Yeah. Because it's your feelings. Yeah. Just like your opinions. You own them. They're you. The only and the only feeling that I, I might disagree with you on is truly indifference. Because it's not, it, it's the absolute absence of feeling. You, you and know. that's usually symptomatic of yeah. other things. And and it's, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, you know, that's not something, you know, it, like, don't ever strive for it. It's the worst. No. It really is yeah. awful. <laughs> and that's, and, and it is tough because, I mean, you're right, because some people do shut off their feelings yeah. and bury them and try to hide yeah. them because they don't want to yes. deal with them. Don't get me wrong. There's a place for indifference. Like, if you feel it, you can't help it if that's where you are. But it's. Yeah. 
but there is something to be said. You do kind of need to do a little analysis and that yeah and just to make sure that you know, just do a little gut check to make sure that it's it's okay yeah if you're you feeling know? indifferent on a regular basis you probably should go talk to somebody because right. it's it's not it's not a again normal feeling mm-hmm. you know it's it's you know <laughs> it's generally <laughs> a broad stroke here but you know it's generally something you see in like sociopathic tendencies and stuff you know <laughs> A genuine disinterest for you know, but anyway, yeah, that is a pretty broad stroke. There's right, that's why I said, yeah, yeah, in there. yeah. I was joking <laughs> more right. so, yeah, yeah. But so that's kind of what I wanted to talk a little bit today on is um, tips and tools to help um, break through a lot of the outside influences and really kind of focus on your true feelings and what you're truly going through. Um, one thing I told her is I said, you know, first and foremost, I said, no sad music. And she's like, right, right. <laughs> yeah. I said, just... yeah. Otherwise you turn into that, uh, the emo, uh, teenager kid, you know, yeah. like life sucks, whatever. And you turn on the cure and you know, yeah. <laughs> like, you're just manifesting, you, you know, you're, you're starting the cycle basically and exactly. it will keep going. So yeah. Yeah. And you keep it going and keep it going. And also, keep it going. I just yeah. want to point out, I'm not knocking the cure. I'm fine with, I like the cure, but I'm just saying. Yeah. I was actually kind of making fun of myself in high school. So <laughs> the cure is not known for their upbeat music. No. They got so, some. Well, yeah. I mean, we can they, all agree on that. They got some. Yeah. I got point, it pointed out to me before, but when I used them, or the Smiths, I think yeah. it was, I used as an example. Yeah. None of us are saying alone known for their up. Right. They have some, but not, yeah. Not known for it. Yeah. But I said, that's the first one. She's like, absolutely. I said, psychic? She's like, what? I said, I'm prescribing kitten memes. <laughs> and she just cracked up. She's like, what? I'm like, I'm telling you. So you need to go on the internet and Google kitten memes, kitten playing, uh, cutest kittens ever. Yeah. I said, you know, wh- whatever you want to go on YouTube over, and type in kitten. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, just because what that'll do is it gives you the a refresh. Yeah. It refreshes your system. It refreshes your body in your mind. And it gives you that moment of, you know, that deep breath that you can just take a step a breath, then you take a step back. And once you've kind of, you know, you've laughed, you've enjoyed your moments. Yeah. Then when you kind of come back from that, it's your palate's cleansed and you can truly see, am I, okay, where am I really at? Yeah. You yeah. Know? Because it's- really the most dangerous thing you can do is be left alone with sadness. Mm-hmm. And also, like you were just saying, and that's a perfect example, is what I found is that distracting yourself from sadness is, especially if you have any sort of, you know, if you have depression or whatever, but mm-hmm. um, you need to distract yourself from it from time to time. Mm-hmm. Be- because if you don't, all you, you'll just keep in those vicious cycles. You know, you need to break those cycles up from time to time. Yeah. Now, I will say that you should be very careful that you don't use any sort of alcohol to do these things because yeah if for no other reason alcohol is a downer it's not an upper it's a downer so you know be very careful with that uh don't let that become a crutch that's Mm -hmm. that's no bueno so i mean it gives you numbness which is the relief yeah but it'll still the problem is the, the the pain will still be there when you sober up Exactly. So then you start, if you start using it more and more, then you know what I mean? It, it just, it becomes yeah. a real issue. You need to solve it a different way. Now, if you go have drinks, like, uh, listen, the night we closed down the comic shop, mm-hmm. we shut the door, I locked it, and there were guys there that were the regulars, and one of them was like, let's go get drunk, <laughs> you know? And I'm right. not going to lie, we went and got drunk because whatever but i didn't do it day after day after day you know it was right. he but was like moment, you, you yeah. needed the distraction but it was more time. about hanging out yeah. with people that i really liked and whatever the alcohol was there and i i drank it but it was wasn't i really was more for looking for the the people i didn't want to be alone with the sadness of that mm-hmm. that's the end you know so it, it's the same mm-hmm. idea yeah. And, you know, and she was struggling some with the fact that, I mean, this was a very, very difficult death. For sure. Yeah. Not that any death's easy, 
but this was an especially hard one for her yeah. and her family. You know, her grandmother was the matriarch. She was the glue that held the family together. Yeah. What so she needed was someone to split their pants at the funeral. Exactly. That's what she needs. We'll, <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> But, um, I'm available for funerals, folks, for a distraction anyway. <laughs> but she, um, you know, and, and so this is very difficult on many people. And she had to leave a few times because sure. her mother or her grandmother was had yeah. chosen to die at home. Mm. So as the, she was progressing and, you know, it was inevitable the direction she was going it became increasingly harder for her to go over to the house. Sure, I understand that. You know, yeah. and she would still go. Cause she wanted to see her grandma, see the family and stuff, but she couldn't stay very long. Yeah. And she was getting a lot of stress from the family I'm because sure. she wasn't yep. there. And she told them, she's like, I can't handle too much of this. Yeah. And she's like, you know, and I said, let me guess. It wasn't the fact that necessarily sitting with your grandmother that bothered you i'm sure it bothered you but you know that wasn't probably the um overwhelming factor of the whole situation yeah. i bet you it's because everybody else's sadness yes. and how they're projecting their sadness that made it overwhelming yeah, that cloud yeah yes yeah. and she's like exactly i said let me get do you have a whaler and she's like a whaler i'm like yeah <laughs> you know the person's like oh my god and she's like yeah i'm like yeah yeah I said, you know, and everybody grieves differently. I'm not going yeah, to judge right. them. <laughs> right. Just saying sometimes it's a little bit. It's much, It's a lot. It, it's it's, it's for... a lot. It's a lot for somebody else to, to handle. Right. Because that's a lot of drama. That's a lot yeah. of um, emotion. Well, what it comes down to a lot of times is a lot of people process like when you have that, like a lot of other people will process that as though they're trying to make it about them. Right. And a lot and so of people, they start resenting that as well as yeah. getting annoyed by, it's like, listen, we're all in pain here. Can you, can you calm it down a little bit, you know? Yeah. But, and that's yeah. the thing. So, we, and it gets difficult because again, you, you can't judge someone for how they grieve. No, no, but tempers kind of, you know, you start kind of yes. getting on edge because of the whole situation, all the stress on everybody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I'm, there's just yeah. a lot of, a lot of layers to it, a lot of variation to it. Mm-hmm. And it's something that you kind of have to take a step back a lot of times and just take a deep breath and, again, not take on other people's emotions. A while back, a few, quite a few episodes back, we talked about absorbing emotions from other people yeah. in other situations and crowds and stuff. Funerals are a perfect example of that. Yes. You know, funerals, wakes, um, somebody's deathbed. Yeah. All of those places are incredibly emotionally charged yeah. by their nature. They're going to be. And it's very easy to, especially if you're very sensitive to other people's emotions, it's very easy to get way sensory overload. Yeah. And you can't even see your own emotions. You can't even feel your own emotions because all you're feeling and all you're getting is all of these bombarding emotions and waves of sadness and waves of all of this stuff coming off of every person that you run into and every person you see. So it's just nothing wrong with taking a break and stepping outside and going, yeah. okay, I need to take a brief breath. I need to clear my head. Yeah. I need to keep in well, touch with myself and where I'm at with things. Yeah. And we've talked about that before too, that sometimes mm -hmm. you just need to step, you know, into a bathroom and take a couple of breaths. I, you know, like I said, the day my dad mm -hmm. died, when everybody was at the house, I went downstairs into the bathroom and, you know, some of the times I, I mean, I, you know, some of the times mm -hmm. it was because I just, I needed to sob. I mean, I, you know, sure. and, and, and a lot of that was because I had already kind of done that. And I was to the point that I was processing okay, but every, like you said, you know, I'm soaking up so much, you know, seeing my mom and seeing my grandma and my mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, just seeing everybody so upset that you start taking all of that on mm -hmm. and it's, you have to have a release for that. So whether it's a deep breath and, or, or you're just, a, a, you need to exhale or mm -hmm. whatever, it's like, you know, sometimes that's just what you have to do, you know, and, and. Again, you know, we'll go back to a great point from uh, Angela's awesome podcast when, uh, like Heno said, you know, you have to take care of you or you're not serviceable to other people, you know? Right. And in those cases, 
you know, I knew where I was at on the, the, the chain of command, basically Mm -hmm. I needed to be serviceable because I needed to be there to take care of my mom and my grandma, you know, even though I have siblings, it just, it felt like it was my job, you know, and that was my doing. Like I felt like it was my job. I'm not saying anyone made it that way. It was just, but that's the way it was. So I felt I needed to do, excuse myself occasionally and, have a, a breakdown or, or just really just have a few deep breaths and try to recenter myself, whether it was for anger reasons, because I was going mm-hmm. through plenty of that that day for, mm-hmm. you know, certain reasons. And, you know, so, and then come back and be like, okay, it's, you know, what, what needs done and, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And that's, and everybody deals differently. You know, it just is. Yeah. And just like we've said many times before, you don't have to understand somebody's grieving process. You have to accept it, though. Yeah. You know, some people grieve with humor. Mm-hmm. Some people grieve with activity. Some people grieve by tears. Yeah. You know, it's like everybody grieves differently. Um, you know, the the day your dad died, you and your mom had things under control with your dad in the bathroom. Yeah. And I was... I didn't know how to process what I was feeling. I didn't know what I was feeling. I didn't know how to process what I was feeling. So the only thing I could think to do, because when something like that happens, people come over and they surround the house and, you know, and it's all in love and it's all in good intention and stuff. Yeah. But all I could think to do was I need to serve and take care of and manage yeah and i don't have time to do anything else that's what i need to focus on right now and that was my overwhelming drive my need i'm like okay yeah so you know brian's aunt's here who's diabetic we need to get her some protein okay i'm gonna scramble some eggs who wants coffee okay i'm going out and getting bagels this chair needs to get moved (laughs) this chair this couch needs to go here yeah and uh that's what i did you know i kept moving things around i kept running my little butt off because that was how I needed to be. Right. You know, that's what my body and my mind told me to do. Like just keep moving, keep moving, don't stop. Well, plus stop. you're you're you put yourself into a nurturing role, which yeah. you know, there's various forms of even that. Like there's the oh, person sure. who's going to sit on the couch next to, you know, the grieving spouse with their arm around them and mm-hmm. there's, you know, the there's different forms of that nurturing, but you were doing that, you were making sure everyone had comforts that they needed or or wanted at that time because Mm -hmm. you know like uh, us remember i mean how many times did we ask my mom if she had eaten you know that we wanted to make sure i did the same thing with my sister when my niece died you know and i made that comment to other people i'm like make sure she eats you know because Mm -hmm. so many people neglect eating and you need to eat during that time you need that to keep your strength up you know, right. you, you can't avoid, even if it's not much, you have to eat something, you know, you're upset. You don't feel like it or you don't want to, or you just don't care. I get it. Mm-hmm. We all go through it, but it's, you know, sometimes that that's just one of those little things that people will overlook. And generally, you know, at a funeral and stuff, there's usually some sort of sandwiches or something, you yeah. know, but you, you know, you, you just need that. And like you took care of that because we had so many people and it was early in the morning. So we had a mm-hmm. lot of people there. You know, and then later in the day, I mean, geez, over the next couple of days, you know, you had all the food, <laughs> but it was, you know, we had so much lasagna yeah. and brownies. <laughs> oh my Lord. I mean, it was wonderful, yeah. oh, wonderful food, yeah. but it's just a lot of lasagna yeah. and a lot but, of brownies. But that's the nurturing role that other people take where they feel like yep. they can't really do much. Like, well, I'll make them food, you know, because yep. I can't this or this. Well, this way they don't have to worry about cooking or grocery shopping or whatever. It's right. here. We'll just take yeah. some of the, exactly. the mundane stuff. Yeah. Away from and them it so is, they, don't, they can focus. And yeah. it's very helpful. You know, when you Absolutely. come back from like the showing or something and you're hungry and it's like, Hey, let's just heat some food. We don't have to go whatever. And you don't really feel like going out to eat because you're just not in the mindset for it, you know, and this way you're still having a home cooked meal, but you're not, you know, you have that comfort of it without it being, you know, uh, fast food or something, you know. But you definitely, I mean, and I, oh, the, probably the most, um, I hate to say even influential death, but um, the one that hit me the hardest, I guess is a good term, 
is a good friend of ours yeah. passed away uh, very tragically at the age of 22. Uh, I want to say 21. Like that. Yeah, I can't remember for sure, but that is something yeah. like that. Yeah, he was in a, in a car accident and um, not his fault. Um, somebody made some bad decisions on the road and he ended up being pushed off the road and running and in, running into a telephone pole. And it was so shocking and so dramatic. Um, I couldn't process it. Yeah. And it was one of the few times in my life that, um, when you see people on TV dropping to their knees and sobbing, yeah, that you're like, oh my God, that's such overacting. Yeah. It's one of the few times in my life that I did. I mean, as soon as you told, cause you found out and you told me yeah. and the first thing I did was I, I pretty much fell to my knees yeah. and just sobbed and I mean, sobbed from my toenails. Well, yeah. Sobbed. I mean, you know, you don't expect someone at that age mm-hmm. to just be just, just dead. Just, just done. Gone. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember it cause I had my head in your lap and just wrecked yeah and Hell, i remember oh, i i could barely say the words yeah. after i got off the phone with this brother it, yeah. it was i mean it, it just it took me i was in that moment i was so shocked that mm-hmm. i i just couldn't almost just couldn't say what had happened because i i just couldn't it, it was the weirdest i was thing. going down the list because i i knew who you were talking to and i'm like okay dad so you're like no mom no i'm like okay you know, yeah. we're we're going down the list. I'm like, oh god, and you know, and at one point when my head was in your lap, you're like, you've got to find some peace with this. It's yeah. like you you have to, yeah, like you, know, you have to mourn and stuff, but you can't. You have to be careful with the hysteria part of it because yeah. you know, you, you... it's like you're going to physically make yourself ill. You yeah. have to find peace, and it was that moment that that caretaker kicked in, and I'm like, yeah. oh my god, his brother. Because we were very close with his brother Brothers. as well. Yeah, both we of them. We were close with both of them. Yeah. And so, you know, the first thing I, you know, I did, you know, when we contacted him and stuff, I'm like, hey, do you want company? And he's like, yeah, you know, you can come over. So um, I came over and I sat with him. And he was working on putting some discs of uh, his brother's music together. And for the funeral, I believe it was like the day after. And putting together some music and stuff like that. And he was uh, working on some stuff, so I just sat there with him, yeah. and we talked, and we reminisced a bit and stuff, but I just sat there, yeah. and we were going over to some friend's house, and we got, got in the car, because I took him, I'm like, you don't need to drive, I'm like, I'll drive you, so I drove him, and I just reached over and held his hand, Yeah. and that was what I needed to do. Yeah. You know, and that's and the s- thing is, in that moment, there's nothing you can do to justify it to him, you can't. Really, no, you you can't say anything. There's almost nothing you can do that really is going to make a huge mm-hmm. difference then. Down the road, right. when you have that opportunity to look back, you start going, wow, you know, my friends were really there for me and stuff. But in the moment, it's just, it's that, yeah. that that's where, honestly, that's where that indifference can come in because you can reach that you've hurt so bad as, as a person in the loss that you yeah. can get, hit that indifference because you're just, you're so numb that you're no longer really feeling anything. Yeah. And just, that's you, where you're barely making yeah. emotions. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. That's yeah. where everyone has to make sure you eat. Mm-hmm. They have to make sure that you, you know, get out of bed and that, yep. because they have to make sure you don't just give up, give up yourself because you right. know, so it, it's, it's such a difficult spot. It's, it's why, you know, and especially as you get older, you know, you hear more people that, you know, have died and stuff. And, you know, like in high mm-hmm. school, there's always that kid that killed themselves or there's, you know, a tragic car accident or there's always a couple of those in every year. Mm-hmm. Book, every yearbook's got in memory of pages just about, you know, and mm-hmm. there's always that. And they're always shocking. And, you know, like when we were in high school, my brother lost his girlfriend mm-hmm. in a car accident. Oh, Yes. And that was our junior, yeah, our junior year because she was a senior. Um, and that came out of nowhere. And, you know, what I mean, it's like I've had a few of these in my life, and it's just you can't prepare for them because they're so shocking. With my dad, you know, across that year, he was given a year to live, and you prepare for it, but you still, I mean, we were physically watching him dwindle. Like his, he was constantly losing weight to where he was just, 
bones mm-hmm. basically and yet still you don't expect it and when it hits you mm-hmm. it's still a crushing semi truck of emotion when it hits you even though that whole time you've been like it's gonna happen you know it you're bracing you're trying to build that up but it just doesn't matter and that sadness still no. you know and, and, and it does and even now you know people talk about oh it gets better with time and yeah bullshit and excuse my French but it doesn't it doesn't hurt any less today than it did the day he died I could honestly I'm as we've talked about this I'm fighting from going into being almost crying the whole time yeah that's how sensitive to this whole thing I still am 10 years later <laughs> well know. I think the best analogy is that every every journey that we go on everything that ends up happening leaves a mark on us you know and the tragic deaths you know leave a really deep knife wound yeah. um the deaths that are expected leave a slightly less deep knife yeah. wound yeah but it's still a knife wound yeah. it's still a knife wound yeah. and and really other to... losses in your life can do that too Absolutely. You know, I mean, yeah. just, just about everything. Losing your job mark, after 25 years yeah, can they really, all mark yeah. You, but they're wounds, and you have to nurse your wounds. Yeah. You've got to take care of them, and you've got to let them heal. Will they always be there? Absolutely. Yeah. You always have scars. Right. You know, your those scars will never go away. Yeah. You always have those scars and they will always remind you of that moment and yeah. that place and you'll never get rid of those scars. They may fade a little with time, but they're still there. Yeah. You'll still remember, you know, that's never going away. That pain will always be a memory in your in your head. Yeah. But they can heal. They can get better. They can you get used to working with that with the scars Mm. you know you get used to having them around they become part of you and pretty soon you grow with them and they do they just even though they're unnatural they're not something you were born with they're part of you they're part of your soul they're part of who you are and they've made you who you are Mm. so there's something to be said for that and i think that's when people say time will heal i don't think they they're truly are meaning that it'll get better in that sense you know like it'll go away yeah i think they're just meaning is someone once said um you learn to deal with the pain yeah so you learn to live with the pain so the pain becomes part of you and it becomes more of a normal thing because you you just carry it with you It's, it's always there it never goes away but well, you just get more accustomed to having it with you. Right. You know, and I think that's very, you know, very astute and very interesting. Mm. Now, something else that I did want to, you alluded to earlier that I wanted to, to make sure that we mentioned. And we've mentioned it before, but the power of humor. Now, may seem incredibly inappropriate in most times it is you have to be very careful judge your audience <laughs> yeah keep your humor kind of to yourself or to someone who will understand the humor yeah but there is a lot of humor in death and there's a ton of humor in funerals and um and, and i behoove you to look for it yeah and we actually if you want to hear like we talked about this when we actually did an episode on death and i just thought of it a few minutes ago we've kind of retouched a lot of it but oh did we yeah um we one of our earlier episodes i think we talked about death and we tell like about giggle loops and yeah. inappropriate uh, laughing inappropriately at funerals yes. and such and that's we might know. have even told the the split and pants story. oh yeah we did yeah okay yeah so I apologize if we rehashed for you yeah. folks, but this is just something that really struck home for me this week, and yeah. I guess I needed a reminder. And yeah. uh, and and there's felt that you did too. Yeah, and like <laughs> you said, well, and it's you know it's yeah it's super strong in my my head this week too. So it's you know it's it's mm-hmm. just there, but yeah, it, it, it's you know uh, like you were saying is you know if you if you're a person who can use humor as a diffuser, then by all means do so but again you know be careful because it doesn't work for everybody there are a lot of people that don't find it as a diffusing mechanism they find it as offensive or disrespectful Mm -hmm. so be careful of your audience on that again choose your words 
carefully (laughs) you know like you said you know at my dad's uh the showing for my dad if a friend of ours came in and he made a comment to me at one point he asked me if he could talk to me outside and i was like sure i went outside and i knew he had lost his dad and i thought maybe that's kind of what it was and it wasn't that it was that the way he deals with things is similar and that he laughs and makes jokes and he didn't want to feel disrespectful to anybody who was inside you know, like my mom or anyone else. He didn't want to feel like he didn't want them to think he was being disrespectful of the situation. And, you know, and while we were outside, you know, I mean, and, and you, this will tell you the level of inappropriate is him and I had a conversation about, you know, uh, stuffing people uh, like after they were dead. And he said he wanted him and all of his friends to be stuffed and put around a poker table like they were playing a game of cards you know and we joked about that scenario for for a little while and he was like you know but i don't want i was like my dad would find that hilarious actually so you know um and i found it funny yeah i get the you know some people probably would not find yeah very much so and you know um in fact i think you know we joked about stuffing my dad and putting him back in his chair like to him oh yeah yeah. to him you know and he laughed at it he found it funny you know absolutely you know, because my dad was the type that was very much like I, you know, I am, and it's there's humor in most situations. It's just a matter of finding it and whether other people will also find it funny. You know, right. I find myself many times laughing, and someone will go, "What?" and I'll be like, "Just, just I know they won't get it." You know, it's right. like <laughs> you have to have my mindset or be similar yeah. to me. Like if Tony's there, I can tell him most of the time he'll mm-hmm. get it. You will get it. Whether you find it funny or not is a different story, but you'll right. you'll at least appreciate it because you only. know me. You'll you'll understand why it's funny to me. Right. You know that kind of a thing. So it's it's got to be people that are very much in my inner circle to truly get it. You know, otherwise I just don't bother because I most of the time it's just that I'm just weird. So yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but that's and, and that's all of that stuff is is okay. It's good. It's it's fine. You know, just yeah. because you laugh because um, the Mickey Mouse ears in the casket makes it look like the, the <laughs> dead person's wearing Mickey Mouse ears. Yeah. <laughs> just because that gives you the giggles. Right. Does not make you less of a mourner. I mean, it doesn't no. make you, you know, your pain any less real. Yeah. Well, none of that. I mean, you still hurt. You know, just because somebody, you know, you're able to find a giggle here or there does not mean that you're any less hurting than anybody else in that room. Like right. You might be hurting more than them. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It just in that moment, that little bit of a giggle is a good thing. And yeah. that's okay. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and in the case of like my dad, it was 100% appropriate. Because oh, yeah. it's the kind of guy he was. Oh, and I'll tell you, if you believe in, uh, you know, someone being in heaven and looking down, it's like, you know, he would have been upset if he saw everyone doing nothing but crying. You know, right. that's not who he was. He was not mm-hmm. a guy to sit around and cry. No matter what was thrown in front of him, mm-hmm. he was a he was somebody that would just, you know, dig in and fight or make jokes because – what else are you going to do? Sometimes you are just screwed. And sometimes all you can do, it's the, why the, there's that old saying, sometimes all you can do is laugh. And that's, <laughs> that's you know, really and, all you can do sometimes. And, and at that point, it's like, look, I've, I've already gone through most of these other emotions. Why not have, you know, why not have some joy and humor in there too? And yeah, plus, just, you know, like me, if you're going to remember me, I'd much rather it be with laughing than mm. crying. You know, I, I just, you know, it's just a better yeah. way to be remembered, I think. But that's me. You know, if you don't agree, that's fine, too. You know, I think everybody pretty much feels the same way in some way, in some point. Yeah. You know, trust me, it it, it would be a little bit of an ego hit if yeah. nobody cried at your funeral. Yeah. But, you know, if everyone was laughing and having a great time, it's like, oh, you know, you miss me a little. Yeah. But, you know, mm. once you get past that, of course, you yeah. know, everybody wants to be remind, remembered fondly and... Yeah. You know, and and thought of as yeah. someone light and yeah. and wonderful and stuff. But you know, to, so you know to tie this kind of into a little different yeah. here because we focus mostly on like death and funerals, but the overall our point overall was generally with sadness in general. And yes. you can use the same kind of things, you know, like you know, you lose somebody, you can sit around and you can cry about it for a long time. Most people 
or a lot of people will go back to work like the next day. And a lot of people are like, wow, I can't believe you're here. Or they'll do something mm-hmm. the very next day that's a normal activity. And they find that that distraction is what helps them move forward. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, and kind of that's what I was saying with, you know, be careful being alone and whatever, like find distractions, whether it's playing a video game, going back to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you lose your job, same thing. Find, try to find distractions if you're um, uh, sad by it, you know, or or obsessing over trying to find another job. It's like, mm-hmm. don't, don't let it eat you alive. Try to find other things that can kind of distract. And I know it's tough, you know, when you, when you're looking at things and you feel hopeless, it's very difficult to find that distraction, you know, but whether it's spending more time with your kids or doing something that you have put off for a long time that you can now do or something, you know, find, mm-hmm. you know, uh, even if it's like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to start reading again because I, I used to read all the time and I didn't have time cause I was working on, well, start reading again. It's mm-hmm. whatever it is, try to find yourself little distractions because those little distractions a lot of times are where you're going to find little, little nuggets of happiness, basically, you know, and if that's all you get, like we said earlier, if that five minutes is all you get, you know, take it and run with it. It's still, it's still five minutes of win, basically, you know, so. And don't run, don't run away from the emotions. Yeah. But use those distractions as cleansing points. Yeah. You know, cleanse yourself of, of all of the negativity and all of the, the dark stuff. Mm -hmm. Then you can get an accurate picture of where you truly are. Well, because, you know, like losing a job's perfect example. Yeah. When you lose a job, it's sad. It's a hit to the ego yeah. and it hurts. But a lot of times once you get past that, kind of get distracted and go back to it, you start to look at things a little differently. And you start to say, okay, am I hurt because I'm sad I'm going to lose this job? I lost this job that I loved? Yeah. Or am I hurt because it's a rejection? Yeah. And it can be yeah. both. It can also be because mm-hmm. you immediately go, how am I going to feed my family or how am I, you know, you exactly. can exactly. I mean, there could be, there's stress. so many different sure. le- levels to it, yeah. but a lot of times you can't really truly assess where you're at emotionally until yeah. you take a step away, kind of get some clarity, then come back to it. Not to mention if you go to, into job interviews with sadness on you, basically to where they smell it on you. They're sad, probably the less, yeah. probably less likely to hire you than if you can go in there with, with a good attitude. You know, if you're walking mm-hmm. in and you basically don't expect to get the job and it comes like, and you exude mm-hmm. that, you know, it, you very well likely may not get that job, you know, because you, you're, you're, exactly. you're not giving off the vibe that they want, you know, like when Same. I, when I worked for a video store, you know, I worked for family video and they had what was called the family video attitude. And if you didn't have the family video attitude, mm-hmm. you, you, I I know people who were let go for not having the family video attitude, you know. And it doesn't mm-hmm. make them bad. It's just you didn't fit their standards. That's all it is. And Michigan mm-hmm. and Ohio are at-will work states. They have the right to release you for whatever reason they want as long as it's – well, you know, as long as they don't tell you something illegal basically. But <laughs> Right, right. But same idea, you know, going into an interview. If you don't have the attitude I want as an employer, why would I hire you? So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So just, you know, make sure I think the key points we kind of touched on a few different times. But, yeah, definitely be careful with sadness. It's it's very difficult. But make sure you truly understand where you're at. Address what your needs are. And then take care of others. Yeah. Um, I think those are, it's very important to make sure that you are where you need to be Yeah. and stuff. Yeah. If if you can help it, sadness needs to be a temporary, uh, passenger in in your vehicle. You know, it, you don't want it to become a permanent passenger and that, that's where you have to be careful is, you know, Mm -hmm. if you notice that it's starting to become more and more then, you know, again, even if you're a person who doesn't have any sort of a mental illness or whatever, Sometimes, you know, um, sometimes therapy is just the catharsis of getting it out of you mm-hmm. can be healing, you know, and it's some mm-hmm. that works for some people. Some people it doesn't, but some it can. So, you know, don't, you know, don't necessarily forget about that, too, if you keep finding yourself with sadness over time. I mean, it's different if you can't afford something. I told we always get that. But, you know, it's. You know, if if you're feeling really sad, if you don't, if you have a support system in place of some sort, use that. If you don't, 
then either maybe start trying to assemble that as well. But, you know, again, you know, therapists can be part of the support system. So you know, don't don't forget about that as well. Or, mm. or, or groups sometimes, you know, like there's groups available at churches and in community centers, libraries, a lot of times mm-hmm. where it'll be people that are struggling with this or that, that sometimes you can go and sit in with, you know, like there's a lot of um, groups out there for um, widows and widowers. They're just mm-hmm. support groups. They're not actually like therapy groups. They're just a group where people can sit and talk with each other and just try to help, you know, just so you know you're not alone, basically. So mm-hmm. don't forget about that kind of stuff out there. I'm sorry. Well, with that, we should probably wrap it up because I have a feeling we're over. Yeah, a little bit. Again. Yeah. Sorry, folks. But we'll wrap this up. Um, so if you want to continue the conversation with me, please reach out to me on Twitter at Jen's Crazy Life. Um, you can direct message me. You can put me in a tweet. All of that good stuff. I will see it. I promise. And I will respond as soon as I absolutely can. Uh, you can also shoot us an email at the Crazy Life Podcast. The I'm sorry. Yeah, at the Crazy Life Podcast at outlook.com or check out our website at the crazy life and brian how can they reach you uh you can also reach the show on twitter at uh the crazy life pod on um again most of it is you know just hey here's what we talked about on the new show but you know whatever uh we'll eat you know if you contact us through that we'll answer that also um uh, along with those other things, we're part of the Tangent Bound Network and the Wicked Radio Network, and I keep forgetting week in and week out to re- re- to point those out. So if you're looking for other uh, podcasts, you know, uh, go check those out. There's a lot of uh, – most of them are, like, pop culture related, but there's a lot of really mm-hmm. good shows on there and shows we're friends with and such. Um, our opening intro was done by our pal Heno. You can find him on Twitter at Ida Heno. Um, he's also part of like a million podcasts, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. and you can find me on Twitter at Stunami, uh, or if you want to check out my other show, Salty Language, it's at saltylanguage.com, or if you want to find it on Twitter, it's at salty underscore language. And, uh, as always, I'll remind you, you know, we're not therapists, doctors, trained professionals of any kind, just two people, you know, uh, sharing our journeys and what's worked for us and others that we've seen. Uh, so if you need help, please go get it. Um, if there's, you know, if you find a, a financial issue is there, keep in mind, there's general, there's a bunch of, uh, uh, free and reduced, you know, programs to help you out. Uh, just look on the internet or check out like your department of human services in your area. Um, a lot of times there's stuff for mental health that can help you out. Um, let's see, I feel like I'm forgetting something else. I usually mention there and I can't remember. <laughs> right. So, oh, uh, yeah, I know what it is. It's if you're in a really bad place and you're thinking of suicide, please, you know, please reconsider and get a hold of the suicide hotline number. Or, you know, if you have a support group, contact them. Or if you have, if you don't, you know, there are support groups available on the internet that you can, uh, you know, if you're somebody who suffers from depression or whatever your mental illness is, there's probably a subreddit on Reddit for it where people mm-hmm. are pretty helpful. I'm in part, I'm in the depression one, um, you know, stuff like that's out there too. So. Absolutely. And I said it before and I'll say it again, folks, if you're thinking about suicide, that that means there's an opportunity for you to t- change your mind. So, you know, as long as you haven't done it yet, there's always opportunity to change your mind yeah. and I highly encourage it. So with that said, I guess this is the end for today. Um, I am going off to bed and I wish you guys all sweet dreams whenever you get to your heads on the pillows and have a wonderful week. <laughs>